All right, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Kiwa from the Aerospace Engineering Department, and he's starting this year. He did his bachelor's from Beijing University in Applied Mechanics with a minor in math, and then his PhD from Johns Hopkins. Uh, his research focuses on turbulence and understanding turbulence using advanced computational methods. I think the most exciting part was listening to him play the piano. That was awesome, yeah. So I'll let him take over from here. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction. I guess I can take my last topic. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, I want to share with you some, uh, um, some of my research topic, which is uh, the joint based data simulation and hash analysis for turbulent flows. So we all know that turbulence is ubiquitous, it's everywhere, and it has, a, uh, has an influence on a very wide range of applications across uh, different scales of problems. Um, take Aerospace engineering, for example, one of the most difficult and intriguing problem is a boundary layer transition on, the, uh, on an airway. So uh, basically, you can see on this figure that at, at the leading edge of the airway, the, the flow is uh, nice and smooth and laminar, but later on, it, it undergoes a transition process and becomes turbulent. So the effect of turbulent um, is enormous. It doesn't only increase the drag of the airway. But in hypersonic flows, sometimes it also create this localized heat and cause some material failure, which actually is a direct cause of the Columbia disaster uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so um, our, uh, our, our focus is that we cannot measure turbulence everywhere. And on the, uh, on the traditional airflow, a bunch of airflow, for example, the most important thing actually is the lo location, is the onset of the transition. However, not onset of the transition is notoriously sensitive to inflow condition or inflow turbulence in the free stream. But we cannot measure inflow turbulence on the airfoil in a few tests. Uh, what we have, however, uh, normally is some pressure sensors or um, shear stress sensors on the surface of the airfoil. So now the question becomes whether we can infer inflow turbulence from those remote measurements on the surface. So this becomes a question of how we interpret those measurements in the context of turbulence. Um, and of course, if we have this ability, we can do many, many different things. For example, we can, do, we can achieve drag reduction because we know the inflow condition and we can develop some kind of active control algorithm such that the turbulence transition can be delayed. This is one typical application of, uh, of interpreting measurement. And of course, it has, uh, has, uh, has influence over even larger scale of flows, for example, the atmosphere or the ocean. This is something that happened recently, quite recently, actually. Uh, it's the uh, Huntington uh, Beach oil, oil spill. So nearly 126,000 gallons of oil was leaked into the ocean from, uh, from, some, under, uh, from, from some, some pipes under the ocean. Uh, and the beach was shut down. And a lot of animals in, in the ocean died, and uh, local fish industry was destroyed. So, um, of course, oil, um, of course, this has a deep relation with surface because we, we know that uh, the spreading of a pollutant content uh, of a pollutant is greatly effect, uh, influenced by turbulence because turbulence dispatch those scalar uh, plumes into different patches, smaller patches, and turbulent dispersion help them to spread over a much larger, much larger domain. So we can imagine if we can deploy some sensor, uh, even if it's away from, from the location of the leaking. And somehow if, if the sensor catch a signal, it is possible to, uh, to infer where the location and intensity of, of that pollutant release is. That would be of great help to enhance our readiness of such as a, as a artificial or natural disasters in the future. So again, this is another application but with a much uh, larger scale. Uh, we, we need to interpret sensor signals from, uh, from, from far away, uh, probably from the source, to go back to the source. And the question is whether this is possible. We have a demonstration of that. So this not only applies to a gluten release, for example, if there's a volcano, Releasing heat under the ocean. Uh, is it possible to run 
to infer where the, where the, uh, where the volcano is based on remote sensor signals. So the two applications I mentioned before review is the same philosophy, where the measurement is not only one number representing uh, the state of the measurement device, but it can interpret it for much richer information beyond the location of the sensing. We know that in experiments for field tests, measurements are often limited by sensor placement and resolution. But through the help of a numerical simulation, we know that we have the gamma equation, which is the narrow slope equation. So a measurement can actually be interpreted in a much richer and reaching way. However, we know that um, the measurement, interpretation of the measurement is also a very challenging inverse problem. We're trying to infer some input from the output. And in terms this is particularly difficult because we're dealing with a high nonlinear equation and it's chaotic in nature. And, often, and also, I can show you pretty soon that this inverse problem is, is actually ill posed. For example, uh, we take scalar transport as a, uh, as a, as a demonstration. So here, uh, I, I simulated three pollution release in the same turbulent channel and showing the forward scalar field. So you can see that turbulence breaks the plume into the smaller patches and come back in downstream. And the pollution re release was at different locations. But we can see that the, uh, the, the scalar plume become very unlike each other after the initial transit region. And as a result, if we measure at the same location, we can see that the measurement signals are highly correlated. In other words, if you want to infer the pollution uh, location based on the measurement signal, it's really difficult to differentiate whether it is, a, it is a source that's far away and strong or a source that's nearby and weak. In other words, the interpretation of the measurement is not unique, and this is a highly new post problem. And of course, uh, a follow up question would be how do we deploy sensor placement such that the interpretation of the measurement becomes more unique? So the presentation would follow this outline. We'll basically talk about two uh, different kinds of problems. The first one, we focus on scalar transport equation, where we assume that we know the underlying velocity, and we focus only on the scalar transport uh, problem. And we have, uh, we have algorithms to reconstruct the source from remote sensing, and we can, uh, we can also show how to use hash analysis to obtain optimal sensor placement. And the uh, second section of the talk will focus on a very, uh, a really um, nonlinear problem, which is estimation of the flow field based on surface measurements. We'll talk about how do we estimate the flow away from the surface based on surface measurement and also a hash analysis based on that. Okay, so let's talk about the scalar transport equation for now. Um, and we'll pick the most canonical problem setup, which is the turbulent channel flow. We assume that the velocity fields are already known and they're stored. And uh, based on this schematic, we call the location of the source XS and we call the location of the sensor XM. So first of all, if you plot the evolution of the scalar plume, uh, uh, the, the mean field of the scalar plume, you can see that the intensity of the scalar plume decays exponentially downstream of the source location which means the sensitivity for any sensor would deteriorate if we move, move the sensor away from the source. And if we assume the underlying velocity to be lower, of course, by solving numbers in conference from numbers to equation here, and we can write the gamma equation for the scalar field, which is the advection diffusion equation simply as a linear operator L acting on C is V. And V, which is the source term of the scalar transport equation becomes the unknown we're trying to find. And it's the aim of this stress reconstruction. Um, and of course, we are picking um, part of the, the friction Reynolds number as 180, and from the number here is 0 0.7, which represents um, air, basically. Mm. And now let's talk about it. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we do this reconstruction? And uh, we basically formulate this problem as an optimization framework. And we know that every equation is LC is V, where V is the goal of the optimization. If we make a guess 
a fee and simulate the forward field. Of course, because the fee is gassed, it's not, it's not real. So the, um, the measurement we obtain from the simulation would be different from the true measurement. So we denote our measurement in the simulation as C at xm as a function of p, and the true measurement is capital M of p. So this two would be different, and their difference basically would make up this cost function we're trying to minimize. Of course, uh, we have to satisfy the gamma equation that is hard constraints. So here we have a second term, which is the cost, cost function times the Lagrangian multiplier, C star. And C star will, will, uh, you, you will see, is actually what we call the joint field. So let's look at the change. So this quantity is called Hamiltonian. Now let's look at the Hamiltonian due to the change of the unknown delta P. So if we write this and move the linear operator L from one side of the linear product to the other side. And this is called, uh, basically, this is same as English by parts. Uh, and then L become L star and on the other side of the inner product. And we, we, we basically can observe that if we make this a joint equation zero, the first term of this delta H would vanish. And then we have a direct relation between delta H and delta P. This is what we want, a direct relation, a proportionality relation between the perturbation of the unknown and the perturbation of the cost function. But we have to solve the joint equation first. And you can see that um, th this relation actually features the joint field C star, which is the result of solving the joint equation. So after we solve the joint equation, we have the gradient direction, which is just H, uh, partial H partial P, which is basically the temporal uh, integration of the joint field C star. So once we know the joint, uh, uh, once we know the gradient of the cost function, we can utilize this a joint looping algorithm to iteratively update our source. So basically, we start with our initial guess at the source, and we do forward simulation, collect sensor signals for our simulation. And then the difference between the simulation and the true measurement becomes the driving force of the joint field. And then we solve for the joint field, and from the joint field, we have the gradient direction of the source term. And we do this iteratively until convergence. So here is a sample reconstruction following the algorithm we showed before. So here I'm showing the end view and side view of the true and reconstructed source in comparison. So the dashed line, the, the red dashed line here, shows the true location and size of the source. And the contour shows the reconstructed source normalized by its maximum value. So you can basically see in y and z directions, the reconstruction quality is quite good. We basically uh, already predict the source in y and z direction. But in x direction, we have this elongated shape of the reconstruction. Um, nevertheless, if we do forward simulations from the true and reconstructed sources, we see that they have nearly exactly the same measurement. Actually, the relative difference between the reconstructed measurement and the true measurement is below 0.1% in this case. Again, this, this, is a, um, this reveals the, the, the U-post nature of this problem. So, uh, to, and, and, and also if we separate the sensor far further away from the source, we can see that the reconstruction quality deteriorates. And this is with expectation. And of course, we can come up with a quant uh, quantification of the reconstruction quality when we compute correlation coefficient between the true and reconstructed sources in different directions. And you can see uh, here, the correlation coefficient R is a function of the distance between the sensor and source. And we can also see that in Y and Z direction, also I'm missing an axis here, so it's from zero to 20, uh, 100%. So you can see that in Y and Z directions, they're basically above 90%. But in x directions, they kind of, uh, they're only like 20%. And the reconstruction quality also uh, become less if we move sensors farther away from the source. Okay, so now we know, um, we, we, have a, we have a sense of this uh, source reconstruction. Now, now let's talk about how to improve it 
and uh, basically by by, uh, by optimally placing the sensors. So the first uh, approach, the first attempt to enhance uh, this reconstruction quality is by using multiple sensors, of course, because surveillance has dispersion effect and it kind of uh, it can affect different patches of the scalar plume to different locations and spreading the information. So if we have a spreading sensor framework, if we have a spreading sensor uh, placement, we're able to collect more information. So we systematically increase the number of sensors in the cross flow plane. So we basically use one sensor, nine sensor, and then 25 sensors in that, um, in that YZ plane. And you can see that the reconstruction quality gets better and better from top to bottom. So uh, that, that, uh, this means that the difficulty is primarily caused by certain dispersion. And if we can collect more information, we can enhance the level uh, of reconstruction quality. Okay, uh, not, not that. You increase the number of sensors, but you still don't know where they are located. So we don't know where the source is. It's exactly the same algorithm, the same initial gas. We just redo it with different numbers. Okay. Uh, from the knowledge before, we know that the reconstruction quality in Y and D direction are quite good. And the main difficulty lies in the reconstruction in the streamwise direction. So let's focus on stream, uh, streamwise direction then. We assume that we know the source is at the channel center, and we only reconstruct it as a function of x. And we uh, kind of we also know that the region between the source is between x is one and x is eight. So we're basically reconstructing this p x. And the sensor are always located on the sensor plane uh, x is ten. And to to, to be able to uh, enhance. Um, the efficiency of the sensors, we need to write the whole system more explicitly or more succinctly. So let's think about this relation between my source distribution Vx and my sensor measurement M. So we can actually write the measurement data as a vector M. We know that the scalar plume is stopped by inversing the uh, vector diffusion equation L, and the M, the, the measurement, is actually a measurement kernel down the function at the measurement location acting on the solution of, uh, of the, scalar, uh, the scalar equation, which can, we can write as L inverse times the source sum B. And L is a linear uh, operator, so it's delta function. So we can combine this delta function with L inverse to a single matrix A. So this way we obtain a very succinct relation between the measurement vector and my um, uh, source distribution B. And they're related by A. We can just write M is A times B. Of course, this matrix M here uh, is not a square matrix. Its dimension is the number of grid points in X direction times the number uh, of temporal sequence I have in my measurement. Um, I need to solve this non square system. With, uh, what we do is by optimization, we form a least square uh, formulation. This is equivalent as time as multiplying the matrix A transpose to both sides of the equation and try to invert the, 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 the matrix A transpose A. And notice that this matrix A transpose A is actually the hashing of the cost function of the optimization uh, common with which is mentioned. And the, the, the ability to invert any matrix lies in its condition number or uh, eigenvalue spectral. So we know that the larger the condition number is, the harder it is to invert. And also notice that if I, if I change my sensor location, the whole sensor, uh, the, the whole input output system will change. So this matrix A is a function of sensor placement XM, and so is the Hessian matrix. So uh, on the left side, I'm showing two uh, typical eigenvalue spectra of different sensor placement, which is uh, what, what one is black curve, the other is the red curve. So we can clearly see that the black curve has a faster decaying eigenvalue spectrum, meaning that its condition number turns to be larger. And somehow, if we can change my sensor placement and the eigenvalue spectrum of the um, 
of the hash matrix become more like the red curve, I can improve the condition of my system. Then I can improve my sensor placement. You can um, also precondition. Yes, you can also do precondition. Uh, yes, yes, that, that's another option. Yeah, but here, um, here we're just analyzing the current uh, cost option. Okay, and uh, actually, the first attempt can be uh, the condition number can be. Uh, oh, sorry, let me mention here. So there are two ways to improve this spectrum. One is that I try to uh, obtain larger lambda i's so that the spectrum rises up in the tail. The other is I try to minimize the condition number lambda one over lambda i. And these two approaches can, um, can basically be done by brute force if we only have one sensor and we, and we focus on this one dimensional reconstruction. So here I have a contour map. I, uh, I actually, we picked all possible different sensor locations on that plane and plot is lambda phi as a function of, of sensor locations. And we get this, this control map here. Of course, in different channel, we know that uh, it's, it's symmetric left and right, top and bottom. So this figure can actually be symmetrized, symmetrically average to, to improve the problem. But uh, one important observation is that the optimal sensor placement obtained by this approach is not at the channel center. Although the source is at the channel center. So we can see that the red cross, which is the uh, maximum, global maximum of this contour, lies off center. And we can try other approach, like if we try to minimize number one over number 15, we get quite similar results. And the optimal sensor placement seems to be off center. And it's not really hard why this is the case. And it turns out that if we have sensors, Placed at the edge of the wake of the plume, it turns out to be to have more ability to differentiate the sensor location. So you can imagine if I shift my sensor in x direction, the signal at the plume edge will change uh, a lot, but directly downstream they will not change a lot. So the reason is really that the sensor should be placed at the edge of the wake to obtain maximum differentiability for different nearby sources. Uh, also, on this schematic, I'm plotting um, basically the, the edge of the plume from the nearest source and the farthest source. And if I do this on this plane, like in a more scientific way, this is our data. So I'm basically showing the mean uh, scalar contour from the nearest source to the sensor and the far, far, uh, farthest source. And you can see that the optimal sensor placement is, is located at, at the edge. Of the nearest source. And we also develop um, a general algorithm so that we can change the number of uh, change the number of, uh, of sensors. So this is a four sensor case. So initially the sensor was placed at the black dot. And you can see they're all far away from the well, from the edge of the nearest source, meaning that they might not have any sensitivity if I place the source as near the uh, near the sensor. But we actually did, uh, uh, we, we, we actually performed um, eigenvalue decomposition and also track, track the subspace as we move sensors around. And then you can see that one of the sensors actually moved inside the plume of the nearest source to gain some sensitivity of the nearest source. So this, um, this approach is also able to separate um, the, the, different sort, uh, the, the different sensors to gain global uh, maximum sens sensitivity of the whole, uh, whole domain. And here is some sample reconstruction um, of, of the source. Um, so we basically compare the initial placement, which is the four black dots, and the optimal sensor placement. So if the source is very far away from the sensor plane, we can see that after 20 iterations, the initial uh, sensor placement gives the red, uh, gives the blue curve, while the optimal sensor placement gives the red curve. They're not so different. And you can, you can even see that the initial placement will be better uh, reconstruction quality for, for the source. But this is actually, uh, this is actually not surprising. But for a near source, we can see that optimal sensor placement can reconstruct the source. 
but the initial placement cannot. So in other words, the optimal sense of placement does not mean an optimal for any possible source, but it's optimal if my source can be anywhere inside that search region. And uh, we're trying to achieve some kind of equal sensitivity for any possible source location. And uh, this result, uh, basically that, that's what the result demonstrates. So as a short conclusion for this first section, um, the difficulty of the source reconstruction comes from two, two parts. The first part is attenuation of sensor signal intensity downstream. The second part is that we know that the correlation coefficient for different sensor signals uh, sorry, the correlation coefficients for sensor signals from different source locations are highly correlated. So the, the, the goal is really to enhance the differentiability of sensors uh, so that we can tell the difference between these two signals. We know that the reconstruction quality is accurate in y and z direction, but in stream-wide direction, it needs need more work. So the uh, quality can be enhanced if we use multiple sensors or can be enhanced by optimally deploying the sensor and uh, minimize the condition number or maximizing a small eigenvalue. Okay, so everything we talked before, uh, we assume that we know the velocity fields. So the equation actually is linear dependent on the source distribution. And now let's look at the highly nonlinear case where we are trying to um, estimate the full velocity fields from only surface measurements. So we're actually trying to uh, trying to uh, 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 trying to follow exactly the same algorithm, and also we focus on this canonical setup of an incompressible turbulent channel. So um, the velocity fields will follow this kind of equation of incompressible Navier Stokes equation, and we can simply write this as u at time step n is a nonlinear function acting on the initial state u zero. And n here represents solving Navier Stokes equation. And of course, when we do the simulation, we'll get some surface measurement only on the bottom and top of the walls. And uh, this is our data acquisition. Uh, so normally we would hope that this data come from the experiments, but here we really use numerical simulation as a surrogate uh, for experiments because uh, this way we can focus on the accuracy of the algorithm while assuming the measurement being perfect. So the only control, unknown control vector here for, uh, for mean S simulation is the initial condition of the flow simulation, which is zero uh, and u zero. And superscript R here means it's a, it's a, it's a reference case, it's, it's a real state. So if we, uh, if we input the real initial condition u zero r into the Navier Stokes solver, what we get is the true evolution of the flow u r, and then we can apply this uh, observation kernel hand on grid to obtain the pressure and shear, shear stress on the surface. Now the question is, if I don't know my u u zero r, and I only have my surface measurement, is it possible to go back from my measurement back to the uh, u zero r? And we basically follow exactly the same uh, algorithm. So if we make a guess of the initial, uh, initial field u0, we have a different surface measurement. And this difference becomes the cost function to minimize. And to minimize this cost function, we need this gradient. And exactly the same procedure in division by parts uh, as we showed before in the scalar quantum part. This gradient of the cost function basically um, it requires that we solve a joint, a joint equation. And at last, we achieve a very similar algorithm of the joint looping. So, first, we start with our estimation of the initial field and then do a full Navier Stokes simulation. And in, this, in, in the simulation, we not only record the forward evolution of the flow, but also record the difference between my measurement, my estimated measurement, and the true measurement, which we call. Absolute and here. That's the error in the observation. And then this error will drive the joint equation backwards, which will then give a uh, gradient of the cost function with respect to the initial field. Uh, so we can do this iteratively until convergence. This is, this is exactly the same procedure as before. Uh, so here is 
the reconstruction results. Um, so on the right, uh, on the left, uh, on the left figure, I'm plotting the lambda two criteria of the true velocity fields, and on the on the right, uh, I'm now plotting my, uh, uh, our initial guess of the of the field, which is a simple uh, linear stochastic estimation uh, using more data. So uh, regarding linear stochastic estimation, you can just uh, regard it as a second order correlation uh, algorithm. You try to use the correlation between different y planes, different uh, vertical, uh, sorry, different horizontal planes in that channel to reconstruct uh, other, flow, uh, other flow information. So this is the best, uh, best algorithm we know so far, except for our uh, adjoint algorithms. And we use this as the initial condition. And after several iterations, we have this as our final results. So you can see not only the near uh, near wall structures are, are computed more accurately, but also some far, uh, some flow structures in the channel center can be reconstructed, although very limited. Okay, to uh, to more uh, to quantify the quality reconstruction with different y locations, we actually uh, also compute the correlation coefficient between the true state and the estimation of the state. Here I'm basically showing the result uh, for for RE power five ninety, and you can see when y plus uh, so that that's the uh, inner units uh, of of the vertical shift. So when y plus is fifteen, we can see that the estimation of the field is very similar to the true state. However, if we increase y, if we move farther away from the wall, we can see that the reconstruction becomes worse and worse. And in the channel center, we're basically only able to reconstruct some structures of the flow. And as a result, we have this curve on the right hand side. As a, uh, so the correlation coefficient as a function of y plus. And we did this for uh, many different RE counts, and they basically follow, follow the same trend. So we see the buffer layer, where like uh, y plus is 15, the re reconstruction quality is nearly perfect. But away from the wall, it deteriorates. And in the channel center, we have very limited improvements. So, why is well, why, why is the case that we cannot reconstruct fine scale structures in uh, in the channel center based on wall structures? We know that this is some uh, somehow intuitively it makes sense, but how do we quantify it mathematically? And this would be uh, related to the hash analysis of the flow. So for simplicity, let's focus on observing only the, the string y shear stress partial u partial y at the wall for now. So we know that the cost function is a quadratic term of u, and we know uh, no, no, it's the difference, the cost function is the difference between our estimation and the true view. And we uh, ask ourselves that uh, we ask ourselves the question. If my initial guess is so, uh, it is it, it, very good, it's already very close to the true state. What's the difficulty for me to just make that final step and match on the true, true initial condition? And that's the focus. So we know that near the true solution, the gradient of, of the cost function is exactly zero. So the basic, uh, the, the local, uh, the difficulty of the reconstruction basically relies only on the local property of the landscape of the cost function, which is encoded in the second order derivative of the landscape, which is the Hessian matrix. So here are two examples of what, uh, what, what, the, uh, what the curvature or the, the Hessian matrix has to do with sensitivity. So if we have a high curvature, if we have, sorry, if we have a low curvature, a change in the, in the control vector would not result in a big change in the cost function. Therefore, we have low sensitivity uh, for, for, for uh, the control, control vector. On the other hand, if I have high curvature, a small change in my control vector would result in great change of the cost function. Therefore, I have high sensitivity. Of course, this is a one-dimensional simple example. In reality, this is much more complicated because we're dealing with uh, millions of degrees of freedom 
And the cost function could be sensitive to only a few directions and not sensitive to other directions. And, and these are all related to the hash matrix, which is second, which is the second order derivative of the cost function. And also another benefit of looking at the vicinity of the true solution, or by other words, assuming that U is very close to UR, the benefit of this is that we can utilize the linearized equations. So here's my cost function. If I simply denote U prime as the error I have in my prediction, then the cost function would be a quadratic form of U prime. And U prime would follow this linearized gamma equation. So instead of the nonlinear mechanism, I, I, uh, we can actually utilize this linearized, uh, linearized equation that governs the perturbation of the flow queue. You can also see that uh, you, can, you can also see that this equation features the reference state U R in, in, in its solution. So now let's look at how we can interpret this cost function in terms of the initial perturbation. So we know that J, the cost function, is a quadratic form of, uh, of partial U prime partial U, uh, partial Y. And to obtain this, uh, this partial U prime partial Y, what we do is we do a forward simulation, starting with U prime zero, and do all the way to the end, and then record my M prime at the end as my measurement. So this whole procedure can be written as my measurement kernel M, Acting on, on the evolution of the uh, of the forward view, or this matrix A times U zero prime. However, this is not a direct relation between my measurement deviation and the U zero prime, because A is in the way, you can see. And we basically follow exactly the same procedure and do integration that parts, and then move this A, move this A to the other side of the inner product. And we have uh, this very direct relation. That the measurement deviation is the inner product between A star times measurement kernel and my initial perturbation U, uh, U0 prime. And A star here basically represents solving the adjoint Navier Stokes equation. And we can see that there's nothing mysterious about it. And A star prime can be pre recorded. We can even store this adjoint view. And for every different U0 prime, what we do is we just multiply um, my U0 prime with the store the joint view U star. Then I have my measurement deviation. So again, this relation is a very direct relation between uh, the, the measurement deviation and the error in my initial prediction. In other words, this adjoint view U star really represents the domain of dependence of my measurement or the sensitivity of the measurement to a change in the initial condition. So let me summarize a little bit. So before, if we want to know the measurement deviation. We need to perform different. Uh, we need to perform different forward simulations for different initial condition. But now, as long as we have the joint field, we only need to time the joint field with my initial condition, and then I have the measurement deviation. So as we said, as I said before, this joint field represents the domain of dependence of the um, of the wall measurement. In this case, the wall uh, shear stress measurement to initial perturbation of the flow view. And we have performed this joint simulation for different RE powers. And in, uh, in inner units, they actually represent exactly the same structure. So this structure is universal and it, it expands if I, uh, if my measurement time is farther away. I actually have a 3D printed version of this structure and I bring it here so you can all. Look at it. Um, so it's very, uh, it's very organized and uh, and uh, and uh, it doesn't depend on finding how, and it develops and expands in reverse times. Okay, now let's talk about the Hessian if we have this uh, direct relation. So the Hessian, we know that it's a quadratic form of U prime. And now, uh, because we can write the measurement deviation as the inner product between U star and U zero prime. So it now becomes a quadratic function of the initial perturbation, which is our control vector, U zero prime. 
So we know that the second order derivative of this is very easy to calculate, and that becomes the autocorrelation, like the, the cross correlation of the joint view. In other words, if I'm observing one location, I want to uh, obtain the Hessian matrix. What I do is I do a joint simulation starting from that marginal kernel, and then I take a joint field, and then I just calculate the cross correlation of that field, then it becomes my Hessian matrix. This is for measuring only one location on the surface. So if we want to measure all sorts of different locations, even like everywhere over the surface, what can we do? So for every different measurement location, we would put this structure and calculate um, is cross correlation and then sum, sum it up to make the Hessian matrix. So the Hessian matrix is really an ensemble average of the cross correlation of these joint structures. We know that in channel flow, uh, X and Z locations are homogeneous, uh, sorry, X and Z directions are homogeneous. So we can also utilize this and do a field transform to the Hessian matrix and analyzing the sensitivity of different wave number of measurements. To the initial perturbation. So that's uh, this is what we have done. Uh, we actually perform different joint simulation and do the ensemble average, and then do a spectral analysis. So here I have the largest eigenvalue for different wave number of the Hessian matrix. So uh, for every pair of, the, uh, of of wave number in plus units, uh, here. And basically, we, we have the level of sensitivity of the initial perturbation of, of the optimal initial perturbation to uh, that wave number of measurements. You can see that the maximum sensitivity is achieved at this location. Basically, kz is zero and kx is zero point one five. And actually, if we pick any any of these locations and, and plot this full spectrum, what we find is this. This eigenspectral, eigenvalue spectral, which decays very fast, it means that uh, my measurements, regardless of the wave number, my measurements is only sensitive to a few flow structures and not sensitive to the rest. So this again reveals the Euclid nature of this problem. And if we plot the shape of the first pair of modes on this wave number, what we find is that we have a very local-like shape. Near that, um, uh, near the both, both walls of the of, of the channel flow. Uh, so here I'm plotting the mode shape UVW uh, components, and you can see they basically represent uh, span uh, basically re represent span spanwise rows. So uh, in other words, if I want to influence my measurements at this time t uh, cam plus is two, then the best way is to put spanwise rows. Into the flow structure. So here is the uh, control plot of the standwise uh, verticity. We can basically see everything is near that wall. And again, we want to quantify the sensitivity for different locations in the uh, different vertical locations in the channel. So what we do is we actually quantify two uh, measures. The first one is the center of mass for the, sh the shapes, which we call uh, YC. And the other one is the location where this profile drops to 10% of this maximum value, which we call Y0.1. And for every different wave member, we pick the highest eigen eigenvalue and look at it in second vector, and then calculate the center of mass and 10% uh, of the maximum location. Um, and then we average over all possible wave numbers. And what we, uh, what we get is these curves. So the average Y location has a function of observation time. So basically, you can see that the center of mass is always located below Y plus is, is 20. And even for uh, the location where it drops to 10% of maximum, it's always uh, within the log length. So it's not very far away from the wall. And we actually have more data uh, afterwards, but at this stage, it's, not, it's already saturated, so it doesn't really change. We further increase uh, the observation time. So let me remind you again of this reconstruction quality curve. 
So we have good reconstruction quality only near the wall, and through the center, basically, uh, we cannot reconstruct fine scale, scale structures. And mathematically, that's due to uh, that the leading eigenvectors of the Hessian matrix being concentrated near the wall. So as a conclusion, uh, so the, the joint basically encodes domino dependence for, for different measurements. And we perform higher spectra of the joint. And we show that it's only sensitive to a few modes in the initial state. And then uh, the, the sensitivity represented by uh, eigenvectors of the passion is very confined near the wall. Uh, with this, I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Um, I think the first part of your talk when you were talking about the um, optimal sensor location. Yeah. Is the optimal sensor location in terms of minimizing the condition number of the input problems, right? The yes. Okay, so yes. does that the main goal is to determine the source of the signal, right? Yes. And does that minimization of the condition number like directly translate to the best location, the best sensor location for like the main objective as well? Uh, if I understand correctly, are you saying that the optimal location problem, optimal sensor placement, and source reconstruction problem are, are they are they combined? Yeah, so that, like I understand what you're trying to optimize yes. to get a solution, right? Yeah. And right, there has to be many locations that you can also get a solution where it doesn't have like the lowest yes. number, right? Yes. Like could those other locations perhaps be better for detecting the signal? Like that problem? Kind of like so um the um the source reconstruction um, is separate from, from the optimal sensor placement. And the optimal sensor placement depends on uh, the search domain. So if you kind of know that my source is already in this region, and um, the optimal sensor placement would be different as if you know it's in a much larger domain. So uh, as you can see from this example, actually the, the, this figure, uh, the optimal sensor, if we only have one sensor, is located at the edge of the nearest source. So you can imagine if I uh, if my domain get pushed away from the sensor sensor plane, then these two contours would both expand, and then my optimal sensor placement uh, would be further away from the sensor. So it uh, it does depend on where your where, uh, where the search domain is. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. So you're trying okay. to keep the search domain local yeah. to your initial guess. Uh, in this case, our initial gas is zero everywhere. But if you, uh, if you, yeah, but initial gas has to be non-zero only within the search region. Yes. So you're treating your sensor place for the continuous way of the problem, but people have been working on the street place, right? Like you have ten locations in a K place. Um, can you compare the computational effort if you had visualized the problem in the work, let's say, okay, I have four sensors to place, but this is less in construction. Would, that, would this be comparable as well, or are you saving some this approach? So this approach is actually, uh, it depends on the dimension of the problem. Um, so what I'm showing here is, is mainly a more theoretical uh, framework that we actually use the brute force and calculate every possible eigenvalue. And what we did in the Marco sensor formulation is that we track the, uh, the subspace of the leading eigenvectors of the whole system. And then uh, if we move sensors around, we will actually use forward adjoint loops to correct those subspace. Um, so I would say this is uh, this really depends on the dimension of the problem. For one, one dimensional case is is quite uh, is is quite efficient. But for four three uh, D, I think the formulation has more meaning than uh, than the computational cost. I mean the the, form, the formulation itself is more valuable than 
uh, <laughs> to look at the computational cost. I know from the mathematics you want to have a L2 norm minimize it, but it's nice But for inverse problems, L1 and L should be normal more than Yes, we include like more uh, penalty terms in terms of L1 and L2, uh, then the cost function will change and the Hessian will also change. But uh, nevertheless, the same, a very similar procedure can be, can be performed. Because uh, what, what we do need to do is calculate the Hash matrix of, of each sensor. So it's not tied to having L2 norm. No, it's not tied. Actually, uh, in, in the paper we published, we did look at different uh, penalty terms. Yeah, but the L2 is used because it's differential. Yes. That's what everybody uses. Okay. Yes. L2 is, uh, yeah. L2 is, a, is the easiest choice. So I actually have a question on it's not related to the map, but more on the sensor yeah. stuff. Uh, so the placement of the sensor, right? If it's a stationary sensor, then that's what makes it difficult. What if your sensor was mobile, like if it had some mobility within a certain space? Would that change the outcome of how well you could locate the center? Uh because we only have results for stationary sensors for now. Right. But I would imagine if we have a moving sensor, the optimal trajectory will become the goal. And we would do a right. very similar, uh, similar approach. But I do know people who, uh, who study moving sensors and they try to okay. maximize information gain at every step. And right. I haven't compared uh, our approach with theirs yet. Yeah, I mean, from a uh, biological perspective, so yes. I work in biological, biological systems, and from that perspective, sort of sensing signals, it's by moving cells or moving bacteria, it's a common strategy where, you know, so you don't just sample from sitting in a spot, but you sample around, and mm -hmm. that tells you, gives you a better estimate of where the signal is coming from. So, or it tells yeah, you just the uh, information. Any other questions? Sure, I have a yes. question. So you you were talking about an example um, about like the hike and oil spill that just happened. Um, and when you have flow, I mean you have like ocean flow, that doesn't look very much like channel flow. No. Right. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how this sort of method might be extended to you know different boundary conditions, different environments, or like yeah. anything like pollutants. Actually, a lot of people are, are extending this framework to the stratified flows. Basically, uh, under the ocean, we have density and temperature stratification, and even uh, salt uh, stratification, a lot of different mechanisms. And uh, also, the velocity, velocity fields will be coupled with the scalar field. And for, for the application, the oil spreading can be even an act, active uh, scalar. So, we can, uh, we can imagine this problem becomes much more difficult because of the uh, nonlinearity. Well, on, the, on the other hand, in stratified flows, we have internal wave radiation, um, which might have influence over, over, over the source rate construction, which we don't know yet. Is there a way to start the questions on the Zoom? Yeah, I mean, if there are any questions for the audience on Zoom. Please go to the participants. I think sometimes they have a hand raised. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So, so I think it, it's in slide 34. Uh, when you uh, uh, talked for the first time about the adjoint. Yeah. Yes, here. 
so, so capital M here is acting as an operator, isn't it? It's not a vector, it's, it's like a matrix. Okay, it's a matrix and it represents... It, it, so uh, well, what does it mean, the notation of uh, M uh, U prime between bracket? Because I thought that, that, not, uh, that notation is for dot product. Is it a dot product here or uh, uh, just a matrix applied to a vector? You mean, did you mean A multiply U not prime? Okay. Uh, okay. So here it, it looks, uh, uh, here we can make a dot product between a matrix and a vector. Yes. Um, so the measurement kernel acts on A U not prime. Also, oh, sir, can, can you can you locate the um, where you're talking about? Yeah, yes, uh, that line exactly where where uh, the mouse. Yeah. 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 So. Um, so a, a, is a, a is a matrix. You can regard it as a transformation. I transform my initial perturbation view to my uh, to my final perturbation view so from u not prime to u prime. So it's more like the advancing of the flow view. Um, yeah, and, so and m. What about m? M is, m is the magical kernel. So uh, basically, the matrix. Yeah, it, it's a it's a matrix and. Um, so in this case, we are observing v u e y. So m would represent taking derivative at the wall at one location. Okay. Yeah. So when you apply this uh, this kernel m onto u prime, you get what you get is a quantity, a scalar of uh, partial u prime partial y at the sense location. Well, that's an that's what it's uh, Ah uh, yeah, the bracket means inner product, vector inner product. So if you regard um, U prime the flow field as a vector, then uh, this kernel M is also a vector. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions on Zoom? <laughs>